So, um, so this is the introductory, so I'm going to just start off with the first lecture. It's an introductory lecture to sort of uh, give everybody sort of the basics about uh, sequencing and next generation uh, platforms. This lecture, like all the other CBW lectures, are uh, protected under a Creative Commons license, it means that uh, at the end of the lecture, oops, oh yes, I did press start. At the end, I didn't? You did, you did, yes, okay. So at the end of the lecture, we're actually going to put the PowerPoints up from this year's uh, full series of workshops on the, on the bioinformatics.ca website. And this year, we're experimenting with uh, a video version or, or voiceover uh, PowerPoint so that we'll have um, the, the presentations also available uh, for download. So if there's some things you forgot or you want to, again, you want to show your colleagues uh, what this year's uh, workshop was about, uh, we'll have uh, those files available at a few weeks after the workshop. So Creative Commons license means that um, uh, it's, a, it's a the one we're using is a, is a, ver a variant of the sort of Creative Commons that allows you to share. So it means you you can take this file, download it, and share it with your friends. You uh, are allowed to remix, and for a PowerPoint slide, that means you're allowed to take one slide out and and put it in your own presentation, for example. But you have to acknowledge who it came from, and um, this is sort of the tricky part. It becomes a sort of like a virus. Your PowerPoint is now because you've taken one of my slides. Becomes you have to share it too, and so it's a share like uh, practice that if you take some of our slides, then you have to share your slides as well. So if you don't want to share, then don't take. But I'm assuming you'll want to share. So, um, as I mentioned, we're going to present the, uh, this is going to be an introductory lecture on the next-gen sequencing. I'm going to be going over some of the technologies, uh, some more in-depth than others. Um, there is definitely uh, not time to, to do, we could spend two days on 454, two days on Selexa, two days on, 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 on uh, Solid. We could spend two days on just doing SNP detection. Uh, there is a, um, it's going to be a really sort of a, a choice that we make, strategic choice, based on the, the faculty that we have, but also based on, on covering what some of the hot areas in, in, uh, in, the, in the field are. So it's, the field is uh, next generation sequencing. People call it next gen or next next gen. I have a slide in my talk where I call it about the now gen. Uh, it's really, it's the current gen. <laughs> it's the current generation of DNA sequencing. There are obviously many of the old uh, uh, capillary um, uh, Sanger uh, sequencing machines still around and, and a lot of departments uh, worldwide, but uh, more and more uh, places are now purchasing the, the new machines. And um, it's uh, even between last year and this year when we, we gave, we first offered this workshop last year, uh, there has been, um, I think it just announced Illumina has got record profits uh, uh, in, in sales in the last quarter and, and it just goes on and on and Solid and, and Illumina, both of those machines as well as, as uh, 454 are, are really sort of uh, fighting it out, battling uh, this very um, uh, active landscape. The, um, the things that we're uh, um, we're going to oversee in this lecture is what kind of sequencing you can do and, and, and um, how does it actually work. Trying to stay away from the vendor specific challenges, although there are some uh, very uh, unique things to some um, uh, vendors' uh, s um, sort of data output. Um, the biggest difference I would say between uh, the various vendors we've talked about right now would be because uh, they're currently they're also relatively short read, even 454 is a bit longer, but the, the, the bigger the biggest challenge is probably working with solid data, you're working in color space, and so I'll spend a bit more time sort of uh, talking about color space and um, and then all the sort of the challenges uh, downstream from that. And uh, in the following two days then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the data sets from, from either from Selexa and solid. So just to set things in context, those of you uh, that are in, still in your 20s may not remember this far back, but uh, I remember when I was in graduate school that uh, 
it was uh, obligatory to show your autoras in your any p paper you published, and so that you had to show that you actually had performed the sequencing, and then you had all the the bars and and and, and on your autorad to show. And obviously, uh, this has changed quite a bit, and uh, new sort of dawn. Um, but so has the throughput. So has the sort of the tools that come with it. And if you go back to just 50 years ago, I mean, the, sort of the, the throughput of one nucleotide per year per person was, you know, all that could be obtained. And so from that, going to sort of the large scale, sort of hundreds of billions of nucleotides per person per year is as with an, this next gen. And between even between last year and this year, uh, we've sort of doubled or tripled sort of the throughput of, of the sequencing of next gen sequencing machines. And so there's uh, um, from the ability of sequencing full organisms where these organisms are small viruses where now these are now large humans um, it, it has definitely evolved uh, quite a bit so um, I think in the uh, before the next generation so in the Sanger world of, of sequencing uh, be it capillary or, or gel based I think we were definitely had a simplistic idea of what a genome was uh, the um, uh, that said, and how much information we could get it, and so we figure out we get all the pieces, we get all the parts, and then we'll we'll, we'll figure out the organism. Um, unfortunately, I mean, even since the first uh, microbial genome, um, H, you know, uh, Haemophilus influenza, uh, it was quite clear that there were a lot of parts that we didn't know what they did, and we didn't understand the full organism. Um, but that said, with sequencing, um, we did DNA, we did some RNA, and we deduced from that proteins, and we deduced from that sort of population organization. We had some sampling sort of experiments where we would sort of look at various members of populations, and so you could have some ideas of what was present, but you didn't have quite a really the, the full grasp. And so you were able to do sort of sampling averages and, and consensus, and and and, and definitely. Um, uh, that, that led to a lot of information. And of course that led to other problems about sampling averages and consensus in that it's uh, really, it confused the information and our understanding of the biology that was there. With this next gen uh, sequencing platform, I think we're still reductionists, but we're better reductionists in the sense that uh, we have a better idea of, of the parts and what we now have is that we have a much better idea of the variation and I think uh, human variation, sort of, as, as, as we always knew about it, but now we know how complicated it is, and it's because we've done some deep sequencing. And um, and then the other sort of very big thing that next gen sequencing platform has, has brought on, although it's not the only way of getting that information, is all the structural variants in our genomes and how they're different in disease genomes and in uh, normal genomes and how they are different between normal individuals, and and that. Uh, is still cheaper to do by sort of really sort of high density uh, genotyping array type technology, but I think will soon be done by next gen sequencing entirely. And so what the next gen sequencing platform offers is is ways to interrogate a genome, be it of a bacteria or a population of bacteria or of a human or a population of humans in ways that are sort of uh, unprecedented. The other sort of big advantage of the next gen uh, platforms is less, there's fewer sort of cloning steps, fewer PCR steps in some of the technologies, and so fewer introductions of artifacts. And so when we're trying to dis detect uh, sort of allele frequency, which are very close to the sort of the um, error frequency of the technology, so you want to have smaller and smaller errors that come from various lab manipulation or and or sort of uh, Technical manipulation of the data or, or, or handling of, of, of the uh, of the DNA itself, and so that's definitely uh, moving there. And there's some uh, there's a couple of vendors that are doing sort of single molecule sequencing, and so that's obviously going to generate very interesting kind of data. It's going to make it much easier to sort of um, assemble um, uh, phasing of alleles uh, along a chromosome. And so uh, that kind of information is going to lead to new insights in biology, questions that we've not been able to, to answer before. So 
quickly old school sequencing, you clone the DNA, you generate uh, sort of a ladder of colored molecules and you sort of, they're all different size and then you separate by size and then you sort of elute that through a capillary uh, uh, system or through a gel and then you detect the fluorochrome of these, of these molecules and then you would get sort of uh, sequences, strings of, of 500,000 letters long. The problem is that you can only do, even with the sort of the, the latest uh, version of capillary sequencing, you can only do sort of 96 well plated uh, samples at a time. So you could, the parallelism of the system only allowed you to do about 100 samples at once. And it took a few hours to, to do that. And, um, um, and that's been definitely sort of the, one of the sort of bottlenecks in, in, the, in the old technology. That said, the old technology it was how the human genome the first and the latter drafts of, of the human genome were done. It was all through uh, capillary electrophoresis uh, and, and Sanger sequencing. So, uh, so Sanger, the old gen sequencing and, and the now gen sequencing. Um, so for whole genomes, obviously, we've done the early drafts of the human genome. We've done model organisms. We've done bacteria, viruses, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and, at, and a lot of things at low coverage. And so. Uh, the first dog genome was a 2x coverage. The first, uh, a lot of sort of organisms you can do sort of low, the cow genome was a sort of 5x coverage and so forth. And those are, many of these things were done at low coverage. For RNA, uh, cDNA clones, ESTs were the rave of the, of the 90s. <laughs> and uh, uh, at first thought to be as sort of a contaminant of, of GenBank, but then you sort of put them aside in a separate pile and you started making sense of the ESTs. And so we learned a lot of technology and sequencing approaches actually led to new discoveries and new tools and so forth, obviously. Uh, from a community assessment, environment sampling, 16S RNA sequencing and so forth, and ocean sampling, the um, uh, Craig Venter's first uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of ocean sampling, uh, sampling of the ocean viruses and bacteria were, were all done on, on the um, uh, old uh, technology. Now with the next gen sequencing, we're sort of doing some of the same project, but we're doing it better. So we can now do a uh, human genome fully and, and do it sort of two and do all the chromosomes, not just half the chromosomes, and not an average of both chromosomes, basically. We can do now, um, there's the 1,000 Genome Project, the ICGC Cancer Initiative. We want to do 25,000 human genomes uh, for both match and, and, and tumor types. And so that's going to be 50,000 genome projects in the next few years. Um, and then um, we're also going to be doing, um, we're, you know, Neanderthal man or, or in the mammoth and, and all these sort of the weird organisms that are sort of frozen up in the ice age somewhere. We only have a bit of DNA. We're going to be able to do these uh, samples through next gen sequencing. RNA-seq and digitization of transcriptome is sort of revolutionized. It's going to, I think it's going to kill the, the AFI industry. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's going to totally replace uh, uh, the way um, uh, gene expression is, is, is monitored and, and, and done right now. I think it's still a bit more expensive than AFI. So I think AFI still has uh, one or two years of, of life left. But I think that kind of approach to chip technology for the high throughput analysis is going to become much cheaper on, on the next gen sequencing platform. And, uh, and what's we're, some of the challenges, of course, is, is sort of the um, uh, alternative splicing. And so we can monitor alternative splicing events. So we can sort of get tags or, or reads that sort of span a splice uh, variant. But to sort of link up all the splice variants together into transcripts, is still a challenge, but that, that not to say that there's not a lot of people working on this problem trying to, to, to figure this out, and, and I think interesting people are, are, are doing really great things there. As far as communities are concerned, there is now much more sort of deep environmental sampling. Uh, the very interesting environment is the Human Microbiome Project, where they're actually exploring 17 or 16 sites on the human body and looking for what the, the normal uh, microbiome, microbial sort of community that's living there, and then being able to use that as a baseline against which uh, we'll be looking at sort of disease states. Uh, people mentioned Crohn's and, and other a lot of disease have been a sort of thought to be associated with with uh, uh, the sort of imbalance or, or things going wrong with your microbiome. But it's going to be 
uh, a bunch of other diseases people have not even thought about uh, that uh, might be uh, associated with the microbiome. And so that's going to be some very interesting things which are, again, we're not really quite good at sort of, we can sort of sequence a whole things and a lot of things and, and we're not really good at describing communities. We're not really good at, uh, so there's a lot of these things, technologies are going to lead software development and software tools to that need identify where the problems are, and then you get some some really good people uh, working on them. There's uh, just uh, this week there's a paper from the University of Toronto on on BarSeq. It's another seek. I should start collecting all these seek names. So BarSeq has nothing to do with drinking, <laughs> but it's it's a, it's a barcoding system so that if, for example, in yeast there the 6,000 genes have been barcoded, and so that if you have a you can have 6,000 different yeast strains living in a test tube, you can sort of throw different treatments at them and then you see which ones survive and which one live. Then you can go sample the DNA uh, and see which ones are still alive by doing this uh, uh, bar uh, code sequencing, uh, next-gen sequencing. They used to do it with, uh, an, again, they used to do it with a hybridization model, like a, a chip, and but this, they found that this new bar seek is, is much more sensitive and it gives a much broader, uh, more uh, depth of, of the things you can do. So we a number of people here talked about the epigenome re rearrangement, chip seek, and all these things, which are uh, there are there were chip chip equivalents and 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 other ways of, of looking at the epigenome. But now this with this new sequ sequencing technology, uh, it will be quite uh, uh, feasible to do, and new very interesting data is coming through. So there's a lot. We're going to talk about a few technologies. It's a lot of difference. The different nanotechnologies these these products are using: resolution of image analysis, chemistry, and zoology, signal to noise, software image size and pipeline, and so forth, and cost. And so that's all the sort of important stuff that's sort of factored in into you know should I use this platform or that platform? And I'm going to try to answer some of those questions. Um, this is a comparison between the Sanger sort of 3730, which is sort of the, uh, the top model and the capillary sequencing, the 454 and the Illumina. Um, people talk about Selexa and Illumina, so Illumina bought Selexa, so Selexa is the old name, Illumina is the new name, and so if I use Selexa, I meant to use Illumina and, uh, and so forth. And the uh, solid AB is quite similar sort of um, in the types. It's not identical, and I'll, I'll get back to, bit, to that a bit later, but it's very similar to the Illumina. And so the amount of read lengths, um, see, what am I pencil? So, um, so if you want to sequence a human genome, you'd say it's three megabases. and actually it's six, because six megabases, gigabases because it's it's a 2N genome, and so you want to sequence both genomes fully. And so if you want to do that, um, coverage, if you did a 6X coverage on a, on a, uh, with, uh, 30, with the um, 3730, uh, that would probably work. 454, 12X coverage is probably good, maybe 15 would be a bit better. Illumina and solid, anywhere between 30 and 40X is, is, is probably good. But it's just to give you a, an idea, so that the base pair reads, you could get 600, 700 on a 3700. 400 is really, that's a really good run on a, on a 454. And um, Illumina and Solid now have, well, Solid is more like 2 times 50, or Illumina now has 75 uh, uh, things, uh, base pairs times 2. So you can get 150 uh, nucleotides uh, off of a paired end read. So, how many runs would you need to do? Uh, how many reads do you get per run? So, as I mentioned, you only get 96 reads off of uh, uh, Sanger. You get about a half a million from uh, 454 and 100 million from uh, uh, Selexa slash AB. So, base pairs per run. So, you're looking at 57,000 nucleotides versus half a gigabase versus 15 gigabases. So you're starting to see the numbers uh, change here. Um, so how many, how long, how many runs can you do a day? This one you can actually probably do four a day if you really like people working at nighttime. Um, but basically two or three a day is, is probably maximum. This one a run takes 10 to 12 hours, so you do about one a day. Maybe if you have really good people management skill, you can sort of figure out how to run two a day. 
And, and this one, it takes about 10 days to do that length of a run. So it's, uh, it's a 0.1, so that takes a lot longer. So machine, per, machine days per, uh, for, uh, for, human, for, for genome would be 312,000 days. So it would take you 850 years to do a human genome. Okay. Fortunately, they had a lot of these machines when they did the first genome, <laughs> so it didn't take them that long. Uh, this one, it would take you 144 days, and this one would take you 120 days. So if a place has 10 of these machines, right there, you've got this, or 12 of these machines, it would take them, uh, you know, a week or two. So cost per run is about 40, so this is much cheaper, but still, for a human genome, that means it costs, in today's dollars, not at the time they did it, because the human genome, as we know, cost about uh, 50, about a billion dollars. So this is about $15 million if we did it today. On the 454, it would be about a million dollars. And on a Illumina, it would be about $100,000. So these, are, these numbers are changing. Last year, this number was half a million. So in a year, this number has gone down fivefold. Uh, I was updating my slide, and so I, I know that. Um, and this one came down about um, to, it was like two and a half fold. And so it's really, uh, costs are obviously going down, but what's, what the way the, the costs are actually staying quite similar, what's changing is how much reads you're getting per run. And that's what's, that's where the companies have really done a lot of an inroad is uh, on the throughput. Yeah? That, that cost, was that a security agent? Yeah, yeah. There's no bioinformatician salaries in here. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So it's I don't think it's it's reagents and it's, it doesn't advertise. Sort of, there's no labor costs in there, and obviously that's a that's an important factor, and uh, which actually makes this one go even higher because this is over many more over 800 years. Uh, <laughs> it's quite a yeah yeah. So you mean uh, first line? First line. Oh, then, uh, why is this number different? Yeah. Um, I think so. That's a good question. So there is basically the logic there is that with the longer reads of the 454 and even the longer reads of the Sanger, you can you can have you, you don't need as deep coverage to get full sort of coverage of the, of the genome you're interested in, and so that. Uh, because of the gaps with, with the repeats, because it's easier to align, so you can align multiple pieces, and because they're longer. So obviously, if we had, if the genome pieces were all 20 kb long, you'd need a lot less than you would not need 40x if you had uh, 20 kb long reads, right? Which is what some of the companies are, are promising in, in, in the future. And so that's going to be that's gonna, if we can get longer reads, then you start requiring shorter reads. But currently, um, I mean, with the 35 base pair reads, not the 75 one, you, you really need 40x for, and so, so 30x is sort of is, is okay for the 75. But that's uh, that's really there's other issues that come up if you do those longer reads. But that's where the company and solid right now. I think the longest read on the solid is 50 base pairs, and so they're they're not quite up there as well. So there's a, uh, yeah. And so um, I think that's 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 the main reason. So with the longer reads, so if you can imagine, with the longer reads, there's more chances of overlap, and then there will be less gaps, and so you won't you don't need if you sort of assume a Poisson distribution of all your 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 pieces, and and how the, they are good at overlapping each other, the, the chances are if you have a lot of short reads, then the chances of it hitting another one is much smaller, and so that's why you need more. So this is another way. So this slide you actually don't have in your binder, and the next one neither. In that, um, I borrowed this from uh, from John, and, and and I didn't ask him about it yet. So that's why I didn't want to print it. Oh, you stole it from you guys. Okay, I should have included. I'll I'll have them printed then. <laughs> Good. And so I didn't. John didn't acknowledge you. I, I'll have a word with him on that one. So basically, this is a plot that shows sort of read length and. Um, uh, basis per machine, and so what uh, AB and and Selexa or Lumina are are at right now, sort of um, 10 gigabases with sort of 50 to 100 base pairs per reads, 
and so they generate uh, 100 million reads in so 100 million times uh, 50, so times 100, um, over four to eight days, and, and obviously the longer the reads, the longer the time. So the 454, longer reads, um, uh, but less, much less data. And then Sanger, even sh longer reads, but even much, much less data. And this is where the companies sort of hope to be, they're promising to be sort of next year. Um, so they're going to be like 120 gigabases um, in Illumina 90, and sort of, and they're sort of jockeying you know, for position at the top end. And 454 is also going to generate uh, a lot more data uh, in the sort of 400 base pair uh, length. And this one, there's no more development on that platform. So that, that guy's not changing. So um, a lot of the figures I have, I'm sort of putting this acknowledgement slide up front, is from uh, a, a paper, a review from Elaine. And um, actually, uh, it's a, a paper in annual reviews. So it's not an open access publisher. Uh, you have a copy of the article in your binder because I've got I have written permission from Elaine to distribute this in my class. So just in case you were wondering, I did something illegal. I did not. I have permission from the author. And she says, this is uh, enough and sufficient for me to allow you to, you're allowed to use my lecture, my uh, uh, paper in your, in your lectures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Selexa first. And, and sort of the, this is what the machine looks like. This, I think, is one of the older machines. Um, where, um, and basically, sort of quickly, the way this works is that you start with your DNA, you add your adapters, and then with these adapters, you're, you're able to attach the, uh, your DNA to uh, uh, this solid support. Once um, you have that, you then, um, uh, with the adapters, they sort of, you do this um, uh, bridge amplification where you basically do PCR of your DNA so that you create these islands of all the same DNA uh, because it sort of attached itself to the surface right next to where it attached it first. And so you have the right, you have this bundle and then you do PCR amplification. So you have a bunch, then you sort of detach it and then so you end up with a bunch of, uh, oops, end up with, yeah. Maybe this is the right sure. to ask the question. So why not read the paper also? I, have to tell. So I, I quite don't understand what bridge amplification is all about and why do you do it? And have it got something to do with the period and bridge also? So which one? The bridge amplification part? The bridge, so that, um, so you want to amplify that one, that's, you've got a single molecule here, and then you want to basically create an island of thousands of these molecules. And so, and you want it right there at the same place. And so you want, so if you bridge right next to where you started, then it will be, that will be the location. So the trick is to have the right density of attachments and it's on, on your solid surface. And then once you do this amplification, then you have locally, you will have this thing happening right there on, 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 on the surface. OK? Um, have it got anything to do with the pair dense part also? That so a that's, a different, uh, that's a different thing, yeah. So this is nothing to do with pair dense. Okay. And um, yeah. And so. Then what you have is you have these these um, clusters of sequences of an identical sequence, which then become your. This is where from which you you do your your sequencing reaction, and then the sequencing reaction uh, for um, is a um, uh, is a sort of a, a fluorochrome terminated uh, the DNA sequencing reaction, and so you basically if the, the same way the Sanger sort of worked, it would stop, it, the, the fluorochrome would attach where it would stop building the molecule once it got one of those, the one modified bases here. All the bases are modified at every step so that they all grow by one. They, the, the fluorochrome that gets incorporated does not have, does not allow the addition of another color. So they all get extended by one molecule. You take, you have this very powerful microscope because now you're looking at millions of dots on your slide, and you have this very powerful microscope that's taking pictures at every stage, and then you're taking multiple pictures throughout the whole experiment. And so, and what happens is that every nucleotide addition is a different color that shows up in that little 
cluster of identical molecules. And so what you're doing through the image analysis, the first step of the image analysis, is to look at these pictures and see the, the changes in colors that goes on. And then that's how you uh, figure out which, because you know one color is one nucleotide, and so you know which nucleotide is being added at that position. Yeah? So I'm not sure I understand. Can you? OK, so uh, in the chip, they have uh, they, they put uh, the random amplified, sorry, random uh, fragments of single fragments. Yes, but they, these are so all, within this cluster, it's all the same. It's one fragment. One fragment? Yeah. And that's why it's an, it amplified at that one location. So all, the, all these molecules here are exactly the same. Yeah, but they are different from that. This one is different from that one. Is, yeah. These are all different. So after that, everything is random. Okay, how, how do you control the position of each cluster and each cluster? Okay, so that, I'm actually not sure if it's a thing somebody knows, but I think it's, it's basically, it's a density, it's, it's a pollution density, so how you, you sort of deposit you know, your, your linkers and, and, and how they're placed on, on, on the so on 454, well, I mean, four five four, basically you have the solid support which sort of tells you it's actually a very well spaced uh, uh, surface that the, the beads can only go at one place. And so this one is, is much more random. What the companies, what uh, Lumina is doing right now is they're trying to make this a higher density. They're trying to get these closer so they can get more uh, high, more uh, reads per thing per run. Basically, and that's how they're getting. That's how one of the ways that they're increasing their uh, um, their uh, throughput. So that's the paired end read, which is a modification of, of this method, which I'm not. So I'm not talking about the paired end read, but this, that's another way. It's basically reading. Uh, both ends of the same molecule. So then you now know they're 75 uh, nucleotides long, and they both, they're like 200 or 300 base pairs apart. And so you know exactly, so you have mapped from the beginning these two reads uh, in the genome. So when you try to map one, you know the other one is, is just a few uh, 75 base pairs away. Of course, that becomes a useful reagent for translocations and alternate splicing and things like that when things are further or closer than you expect. And so that's a way that that's being used uh, for, for that kind of study. And copy number variation as well. Are there also uh, one sec. You're first here. Now I'll get you. The big cluster of the activity one read. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the signaling. Are there problems? Yes, so not as bad as, as 454. So that, that's definitely a, one of the drawbacks of 454 is the, the homopolymer detection. But um, this, actually, uh, Michael is probably better at answering that question. So maybe. No, I mean, the selector, selector is actually immutable when it comes to interest notification. And there are some and he was talking about, talking about homopolymers. Right, right. Well, yeah. that's, that's I mean, with n not having insertion and deletions on homopolymers. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. In general, yeah. Very few Much more, uh, yeah. So whether or not it's a homopolymer. When what goes on? Sure, yeah. But we haven't seen that machine yet, so. Well, it's mostly a software issue, too. Yeah. You know, when, when they look at all the spots, you know, image, from the instrument, they yeah. have to be able to tell where the, the spots are apart. Yeah. Where the connection starts, where the connection starts. And they're just going to have to resolution of the I have to speed up a little bit, but yet another question. Kind of an Okay, and we'll catch them with coffee break. So I'm going to try to go a bit faster now, just looking at the time. So basically, this is the uh, Illumina data. So you have. You follow spot, uh, the top spot over, you 
can see the different colors. And so basically the image is, is a, a multi-layer TIFF image so that you have progression, changing of color over time that is layered into uh, one image. And so you see the changing in color and so you can sort of read, so it goes from green to where that's blue again, D and so forth. And so software does that. You can obviously read it off yourself, but then just uh, uh, the first step of the pipeline for Selexa or Illumina data is to do that. And the same here, you look at another tough, uh, you know, sort of cluster of of of, um, of, it, of sequences, and then here you have a homo a T polymer, and then uh, so forth. So I'm going to quickly go over the um, the solid uh, preparation. And, um, and amplification and preparation of samples. Um, one thing actually I didn't mention with uh, Selexa, but it's also, uh, or Illumina, and it's also very true, it's even more true for, for the solid, is that you have to anticipate a lot of storage needs for uh, that, uh, that the pipeline. And so um, your laptop that you're using today will not be storing, you know, it could store maybe one experiment, but <laughs> You'd have to have, you know, most people don't have terabytes on their laptops, and so that's definitely been one of the, the the sort of big concerns. Not only it's not as much a storage issue as a bandwidth issue within your network of your institution between this this uh, sequencing machine and the server farm, is that uh, the sort of the needs of, of high bandwidth, uh, fast transfer rates. So the um, the solid um, uh, platform works. Oh, this is Michael Bruno, one of the instructors. <laughs> he's not a late student; he's a late instructor. <laughs> and uh, actually, he works on solid, so it's, it's a very timely appearance. <laughs> He'll answer your question. Um, so this is; these are images from the paper, which are actually images from the solid website. And so, yes, I know I'm over time. I'm going to try to go fast. Um, so basically, what we have here is we have single-stranded molecules. Uh, attached to uh, the glass slide in a, again, a sort of a um, somewhat random but um, um, uh, uniform sort of type distances. And what the, uh, it's a, um, it's more a uh, uh, ligation uh, type issue. And so what they have now is they have four colors still, but they're working in, in a totally different space. And so what we have is that we have your dye based probes, which are the different colors, which are attached at a unique spot. And so basically, um, you have your primer, and then you have, uh, you know exactly, and the, the sort of P1 adapter, you actually know the first nucleotides of your adapter because you set that. And then you have the, your template sequence, which is from your, your, your sample that you're looking at. And so you attach that, and uh, only um, um, so you know sort of the uh, uh, the first two, and then these are um, can only attach with uh, because of the, the matching of these two uh, nucleotides. So basically, you excite, you get a fluorescence, and then you get a color. You um, you remove the, the 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 fluorescent. You have a a cleaving uh, reagent, and then uh, the whole thing starts over, and then you add some more. And basically, you repeat that step, and then so every, uh, and basically what you're interrogating at that stage, you're only interrogating two nucleotides, although the other ones have to anneal, but you only know about two of the nucleotides that you've interrogated at. And then you remove this whole molecule, and then you start over with a shorter primer. So you're going to shift the experiment and do that experiment again that we've just done, all those steps where you take pictures at every step and so forth. And so now you're uh, again interrogating two nucleotides at every um, seven or eight nucleotides. And so what you end up doing is you end up doing this uh, five times and every position out of the 35 MERV, because you're looking, you're interrogating five MERV, in this case it's 35 or it could be 50 now, You've got two, you have information about two, uh, you have two informative positions that tell you what's at that position. And so you end up with um, a 35 uh, nucleotide read length, which has informed you what was at that position uh, 
across the, the molecule. And this, I'm going to try to come over here. And so you um, you have now um, these different colors, and what each color does is it tells you not what nucleotide is there, is what pair of nucleotides is there. And so, um, oops. And so the uh, the color now is going to. So these are the four different dyes, uh, telling you you have an AA, AC, and so you have so. Actually, let me rephrase that. If you have this color, then you have one of these uh, four pairs. If you have this color, you have one of these pairs, and so forth. So one color gives you four possibilities. Okay. So if we have this sequence, I'm going to try to go through the exercise of translating the color space into nucleotide space. If you have this sequence, you start at the five prime end, you replace the first dye base AT at this position and correspond to code three from the table. In the code 3 you have, I'll show you in the next slide, it tells you which uh, color that is. And so code 3, it tells you, okay. so I start with a T, and then I have code 3, so then I need the next letter. Okay. So we sort of go like that throughout the, the, the whole molecules. Uh, there's some rules here that are sort of useful to know. But basically, let me just jump um, across to this uh, so in this case, the first one is an A. It's a the red dye, so we know that the first base is an A, and then this, it's the red dye, then the next one is a T. So then I put a T down. The next one is a green dye, so I have a T and green, so I have a T and then green, so the next one is a G, so I put a G down. The next, so the G is a blue dye, and so if it's a G, first base is a G, if it's a blue dye, then the next one is a G. So all the homopolymers are all blue. So AA, uh, CC, GG, CC, that's always blue. So GG is blue. And then you have, uh, so you have a G here. You have a G, then you have a yellow, so G is a GH, and then you have an A. Then you go like that throughout the whole molecule. So solid data sort of looks like, one part of it looks like this, which is basically you have the first nucleotide, because that comes from the primer, and then you have the color code. Um, so I had um, anticipated, and this is sort of an analysis pipeline, anticipated actually going through this with all of you right now and getting you to do this. We won't have time to do this right now, but we'll uh, maybe tonight uh, we'll, we'll do it at the lab, which is basically to do, take one of these and change it into a nucleotide space and see what the nucleotide is, try to figure out, understand what the, the software is doing. What the software is actually doing is it's using these numbers. It's actually not translating into nucleotide space. It's actually using this, uh, and it's, it can use that because it actually makes it easier to, to see uh, errors, for example, or to see SNPs. And so SNPs will appear as two agents and color changes. And so if you have so the same blue, green, and then two colors are different, and then colors resync again, that's corresponding to a SNP. When you only have one color change, it's actually telling you there's an error in one of your detection or, or, or base calling or something. And then um, you have detection, deletions and, and insertions, which have, uh, so these become diagnostic of the type of changes that you're seeing in your DNA, and that's been very useful. And, and Michael uh, Brudno is gonna talk quite a bit more about this. 454, um, much you know, smaller number of runs, uh, sorry, number of reads per run. Um, Technology-wise, it's basically um, single-stranded. You have adapters, and what you do is we were just talking about is you have these micelles, which are then become in a single micelle. You have a clone basically of one molecule, so that one micelle has will have a signal from one single molecule, and then you put these micelles. On a, in a sort of micro titer or nano titer uh, type plate, and then you will sort of capture the images that are generated from uh, light being emitted every time you have uh, uh, a nucleotide added, and that's what you capture. And this is not a microscope, it's, the, the, it's a much sort of not as high resolution as, as the uh, solid Alexa, and so you don't need as, as fine tuned, uh, more a CCD type camera to, to detect these. and, and and so forth, and smaller file size, and, and so forth, and easier to process. 
But it's actually more complicated than that. You have quality score files, you have mismatches, you need to align the reference to a genome and often so there's the challenges of doing a, a de novo sequencing versus a resequencing project. And so the, the next gen sequencing platform for let's say for the human genome have been good to resequence the human genome because we already think we have a, a, a template of the human genome. For doing a bacterial genome that's never been sequenced before, it's, you're much better off going in a 454 technology because you're getting longer reads and you have to assemble de novo. And so that's uh, some of the things that uh, some of the choices you have to make in those platforms. Also, in a big new player last year, PacBio, that was their website. So this year they actually have a real website. <laughs> and they actually, uh, there's a cute little video on how the technology works. And this is like um, Helicos, is a single molecule sequencing. And so um, it, it's, it, it looks promising, although they've published papers. And of course, when you start publishing papers, you start showing the world your dirty laundry and showing the reviewers your dirty laundry. And, and there's definitely, this is sort of a chromatogram off of a packed bio machine. And there's definitely some of these, um, uh, what do you call these, dark bases? Is that what you call them? Yeah, dark bases where um, there are things which don't show up, which should show up, or the things, and it's not a uniform over time because uh, you're, um, you're dependent on the DNA polymerase going through these various sequencing, this one molecule. And so the, the DNA polymerase, because of homopolymers and, and various types of things, so the structure of the DNA may slow down or, or speed up. And so it's not as uniform as some of the other technologies. But that said, it's, it's quite promising, and uh, we're still expecting a machine to be rolled out from this company in the next, uh, so it was early, early 2010 is, is the latest, uh, uh, latest estimate. The things to keep in mind is all people are learning, and so uh, and so you can obviously learn a lot from each other and from the people in the room and from the people in your institute. The technology is work is changing. This workshop this year is different than the same workshop, same topic last year, and, uh, and as I mentioned, we can only do so many things in two days. And I hope we'll uh, you'll be able to to see some of the things uh, you need to learn. Um, other things that you have to keep in mind more is not about the specifics of a technology and the specifics of, of a way things are being done, but more the process by which it's being done. And because the, the read lengths are changing, the technologies, the software, and everything is changing. So you'll have to, what you learn this week is going to be different than what you'd be uh, learning, having to do in, in a few months. And so you get it, but you'll be, hopefully, you'll be in tune with the, the way of thinking about this kind of data. And, um, and and so forth. Obviously, cost of machines is an important factor. That's sort of stagnating for the two, uh, you know, big ones at about half a million. Um, Helicos, I think, is advertised is going to go for like over a million. Um, Pack Bio, unknown, you know, maybe several million. But I don't, I have no idea. But it can sequence the human genome in four minutes. So, how many millions are you willing to pay for that? <laughs> and uh, so all these things are, are going to change. Uh, whether you're a department and you have one machine, it's a 454, or if you have your genome center that has 15 machines, uh, it's going to you know, very much influence the type of infrastructure and types of things and types of projects you embark on. And so all these things uh, are, are, are quite important. There was a recent um, um, tweet I read somewhere that in the Beijing uh, Genome Center, they have 22 machines and they have 250 bioinformaticians. So they have 10 bioinformaticians per machine. And so if you're getting one machine, think about how many bioinformaticians you'll need to recruit. <laughs> and of course, the software is changing all the time. This is just a quick snapshot of what we have here at the OICR. So we have 14 machines. So we have seven solids and seven selexas. And this is the amount of the hardware we have. We have about uh, 1.2 petabytes. We have about 1,600 core clusters. We have about 120 sort of different types of servers. And basically, the Genome Center is not the only purpose of the OICR, but it's the main purpose. And it's the main purpose of why we have this kind of infrastructure. So obviously, this 14 machines is a lot of machines, uh, but it's, um, it's sort of um, uh, what we have. This is also, you know, what's coming up next is another tweet about uh, you can uh, text me your blood sample so I can over my cell phone line. So we'll be texting each other our, our genomes pretty soon, and uh, and uh, that should be quite interesting. So um, 
We have coffee break here, which has sort of shortcut it a little bit, but we'll we'll sort of make do. And uh, then we'll have uh, Michael Brudno's, uh, sorry, Michael Brudno's lecture. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.